Assalamu alaikum. Deeper than just my speaking. And you will absorb something that I will say. And take it back home with you. A little seed that I might be able to put into your hearts that will grow and maybe become something much larger and much bigger than I will be able to convey in this very short time that I have just now to speak about Edisa. Edi, who is Edi Saab to us? What have we thought of Edi Saab? Who do we think he really was? A social worker? Yes? We all think he was a social worker, don't we? Will you just raise your hands and tell me if you think he was a social worker? He was a social worker? Well, let me tell you just now, he was not. Idi Saab was not a social worker. Idi Saab was a social reformer. He was a revolutionary. He was the only practical Sufi. Do you know that in the subcontinent, Islam has been spread by Sufis, not by militancy. It hasn't spread anywhere in the subcontinent and with militants, has it? There were no wars for Islam. It was the Sufis that spread Islam. It was Khwaja Nizamuddin, it was Ajmer Sharif, it was Data Ajveri. It were these people who spread Islam in this area. But they spread it with prayer, in silence, with the people who came to see them, reached them, found them, searched them, met them. And it still spread that far and wide. Abdul Sitar Idi was a practical Sufi. He was the only practical Sufi. He came out and he spread Islam, another Islam. The Islam that the Sufis had spread before and that we had lost the essence of now that we no longer could associate with other than dogma and ritual. If we say our five times prayers, we say keep our uh, rosas and we go for hajj. And so that's Islam. Abdul Sitar Idi saw that we had lost the essence. The Sufis had gone. We left them far behind. They taught us empathy. They taught us all the true meanings and essence of Islam, but time and then the absence of other people coming in to spread it again or reinforce it changed. It changed to dogma, it changed to ritual, it changed to militancy. What did Idi Saab do? Idi Saab said, come back. Come back to the essence of Islam. Let's give up the dogma. Let's give up the ritual. There's no need. What is the dogma? What is the ritual? Let me tell you what the dogma and the ritual is. I spent three years, not six months, three years with Idi Saab. I lived in his homes and I traveled with him. I bathed dead bodies. I picked up little children with bilkis who were thrown away in the garbage and uh, tied coffins in them. I jumped over corpses. So I did all the things that we have never seen, I had never seen. 
It was a different world, two worlds, our world and their world. And let me tell you that we don't look at their world. We don't look at the world of the deprived. Look how we treat our staff. We don't make anybody grow. Look how we look at look at how much indignity with which we treat people lesser. Lesser in what? Lesser in money? Look how we treat them, we all. Our parents, we've all seen it in our homes. I have, and I equate myself with all of you, that we've all seen how we treat them. They're lesser. Let me tell you, they're not impressed with us either. I've lived with them. They're not impressed with our jewels. They're not impressed with our homes and our cars. They're not impressed with the kind of human beings we are. They're not impressed. They're not impressed with presidents and prime ministers. They don't want to know us. They see in us a cheapness, a soullessness that we have forgotten to see in ourselves. And who are we? We've just won the lottery of life, really. We were born privileged. That's all. We had a bed to sleep. Our parents gave us the bed. We have food to eat. And we have an education. You can come here and you can sit here. And you can educate yourself and you can become something or the other or whatever you want to do and think, wow, I'm somebody. But no, who are you? How did you get it? Did you try for it? Well, those are people who are trying and not getting it. So you've got the lottery of life. You've won it already. And what are you going to do with it? So when I was with Idi Saab, and I was living there, I realized and was so humbled by the fact that by the fact that these people are much bigger than us. They have souls. We have bodies. They think. They, they're aware. We're just educated. In what? Biology? History? Geography? Is that your education? Where's the soul gone? What's the soul taking you? Where is it taking you? It's taking you nowhere. And with Idi Saab, on one occasion, let me just tell, me a little, tell you a little story so that we come back to the dogma and the ritual, that Every Friday, he bathed thousands of mentally handicapped children. And he had made a well where he had made his own medicine with sulfur and water. And they would all come and sit in front of him and he would pour water on over their bodies. So that the bed sores that they got because of the lack of cleanliness uh, would heal quickly. So every Friday he did that. And it took him, I think, about three hours of sitting there and pouring water over every child or boy, grown maybe even some your age. And I would be sitting with him. And once we got up and went, it was Friday, and a m Straight after that, Idi Saab just stood in a corner. I don't even think he had turned his face to the Qibla. And he said his prayers. 
It's Friday prayers, which were over. By then it was four o'clock or five o'clock. And a Malvi was standing beside us. And he asked me, he said, look at Hiti Sahib, he didn't even do his wuzu. And he's washed all these dirty boys and all the filth is on him. And the time for Friday prayers has passed. And because I was writing his book, it was important for me to know the answer to what he had done and why. So I immediately said what the Malvi said and asked him that, what, what, what do you say? He said, go and ask that Malvi, whatever I've been doing for the last four hours, was that not Vuzu? Was the timing of the prayer important? Was it important that I wash myself with another kind of water? I've already said my prayers, that, that those were my prayers, that was my ablution. So the dogma, what's the dogma here? There's no dogma here, it's gone. Another time, to a German uh, journalist of Der Spiegel, who asked him how, as a Muslim, he picked children who were not legitimate and requested that the parents should put the child into the cradle, in the cradle scheme, so that he could look after the child and not to kill the child. And they got about 35,000, by now I think over one lakh children, like that. And of course the mullahs were very angry with him and he was, his, life, his life was always under threat because of these very radical, futuristic or revolutionary things he used to do. The journalist asked him, how do you do that? And he said, there is no such thing as an illegitimate human being. How can a human being be illegitimate? It's not possible. So here was a man who studied four classes in Gujarati only. He never went to a school. He couldn't write his own book. He couldn't even read what I'd written. Here was a man who was so enlightened and aware that there's no such thing as an illegitimate human being, where even in civilized countries, in the West, they are named and abu abusively and called abusively. Even there they haven't woken up to the fact that this is not a possibility for any person. So where's the dogma and the ritual? He erased it. And then he passed away now. And when he passed away, his instruction was, Bury me in the clothes that I wear. We have forgotten, it's just been four months. He said, bury me in my own clothes. He had two pairs of clothes. He used to wash them himself. himself. He used to make two pairs every year. And he wore, told them to make him wear his clean clothes the washed pair, as a coffin and bury him and give the white unstitched cloth that we are instructed to wear as a coffin as compulsory to being buried as a Muslim. He said, give that cloth to someone who will wear it in the world who doesn't have clothes and bury me in my stitched clothes. 
Where's the dogma? If any of us had gone to be buried like that, no mullah would have read, read our janaza. They would not have come. They would have said, there's no coffin. It has to be unstitched. People want to go have their coffins washed in the miracle waters of Zamzam. And they think that will purify them. They think that is going to help them. They think that, oh, this great, clean, pure, white cloth washed in Makkah, in Zamzam, is going to be of any help. Idi Sabire is that. He said, it's not going to help. Throw it away. It doesn't matter. It's of no help. He erased the dogma again. The ritual. He went for Hajj. And all the time, after the Hajj, one Tawaf, when he finished his Tawafs, he did his Hajj, he was working in the dispensary. That he had driven to Hajj from Karachi. And he had taken the dispensary and the medicines, and he was working there, in that dispensary. Wounded people, sick people, people with temperature, people with flus. And Bilkis kept telling him that, let us go and sit in the Kaaba. We are here. I want to go and sit and pray. He said, no. He said, this is the Kaaba. What I'm doing is the Kaaba. Uh, this is prayer. Why do you want to go and sit? He doesn't need you to sit. So just these little instances, I mean, that's why I'm saying that the subject is so vast. The name Idi is so short, but his subject is so vast. The philosophy is so vast. I can't put it all together for you to take away with you. But I do hope that you'll absorb something from what I say, something. That will implant inside you and impact you, so that when you leave here and you go back to your colleges and you study, you go back with a purpose, not with just having completed an education. What's your purpose? An education without a purpose, I'm sure, I feel that you must have some objective and some, some goal to be studying. There must be something in all of you that wants to make you become something. Well, in becoming whatever, whatever you want to specialize in, Whatever you want to be in your life, don't just be in it alone. Try to encompass humanity with you. Try to work for the world. Try to become bigger, not smaller. Don't aim so small, aim big, dream. Abraham Lincoln had a dream. He abolished slavery. Dr. King had a dream. People have dreams that affect humanity, that affect the globe, that affect the world that you're going to be living in. I'm here right now talking to you and I'm the present and you're the future. But every moment that is passing, every moment that is passing, I am becoming the past, and you are becoming the present. So if you're becoming the present, what kind of present are you going to come, become? 
Are you going to become at the present that we already have? That's not enough present. We need a leadership. We need people who think for other people. We need empathy. We've lost our empathy. We need to excel, but excel big. Excel to achieve something that will leave us in the history books of the world. Idi Saab had a dream. Mother Teresa had a dream. Gandhi had a dream. All people you remember had a dream. I have a dream and people who have dreams are impatient. They're impatient because they want that dream to come true very quickly. I'm impatient because I have picked up, picked up this dream. I began TDF which is the Termina Durani Foundation a year ago, we've been functioning for a year now. And when I took it to Idi Saab and Bilkis and Pesel, the document for their blessings, it has been put up by Idi Foundation on the same, in the same way of low cost and no air conditioners and no, uh, you know, the usual things that go with NGOs. It's not an NGO, it's a movement. It's an institution of learning. It's a global institution of learning to spread Idiism, to spread the Idi philosophy, to spread the empowerment of women. And the only way women can be empowered is if they become economically independent. This is my experience. And the children of war who are going to be the future of this country and the world. It's a global village. We are all under threat of what kind of future we are going to leave behind. So I'm impatient that very late in my life I have found my purpose and I am moving on to spread this globally so that we can all become contributors to changing the world, mindset. Humanitarian jihad instead of militant jihad. This is a jihad. Poverty. To fight for those who can't fight for themselves, to look, to open our eyes. So for me to be able to try to do that and spread it across the world, to empower Muslim women especially, to become a force, which we are, a resilient force. And I have left a book which explains how we are going to do it. It's very simple, very easy. I'm impatient and I hope that one day the whole, the entire Muslim world, 53% which is women, is going to become a decisive factor in decision making and in their own lives. And for the children of war, how do we rehabilitate them to come back into the mainstream and not become militant, not be angry and not think of the injustices that are unforgettable. Even if they happen to adults, they're unforgettable. So imagine when they happen to children, which is what my last book was about, Happy Things in Sorrow Times. So in this global movement, TDF, when I took it to Idi Saab and I put the papers in front of him, he put both his hands on the document 
and shut his eyes. And he said to Bilkis, Faisal and me, he said, now my movement has begun. Now. My mission, sorry, not movement, my mission has begun. That was after his entire lifetime. He said it was beginning now. Why did he say it was beginning now? Because he knew that now somebody was going to pick it up. And now somebody was going to take it and make it and spread the philosophy that he had lived his entire life proving. Because when he began to work at the age of 18, he realized that he was not a, he was not a Maulana, he was not a preacher, he didn't know Islam, he had not read the Quran, his mother said her whole namaz saying Bismillah Rahman Rahim. He was not an Islamic scholar. So how was he going to teach the people to move back to the faith in its reality and essence? And he decided that he would live his entire life as an interpretation of the Holy Quran. But it would traverse a lifetime. Only when he died would they realize that his life is an interpretation. You don't have to give up all your clothes. You don't have to give up your way of life. You don't have to do anything of, like that. You can't become Eidi. That was an example, a complete, pure, strong, Example. But you have to take something from it. You have to share. You have to give a little, go home and give away what you don't want. Stop hoarding. Share. We've got too much. Give it away. Give something, give something back. Just don't keep, t you're either a taker or a giver. Well, take, but please give. So learn that bit from him. And if you can learn that bit, just that bit of sharing, you will see that it will grow. Something will begin growing in your soul where you will become more aware. A consciousness will develop. When you start talking to people with problems, your consciousness will develop. When you start treating your staff better, a, comp a, 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 a consciousness will develop. When you stop when you stop being so self-absorbed and narcissistic and suffering from slopsicism, I would say, you will look at other people and another time and another world and your futures. And in those futures, I hope all of you will show excellence. And you can't show excellence if it's just about you. Nobody. You tell me one person in your history books who is ex has shown excellence just for themselves by being something, thinking only about themselves. It's always been about mankind. So spread it. Take it. I think I've already spoken too long, <laughs> but I don't know. I, was, I didn't come here prepared at all. Um,
but, but, I came unprepared. Yesterday my husband was rushed to hospital and he wasn't well and I was completely preoccupied. Um, and I felt, isn't this life? We are unprepared. Some event comes and takes over. I should be thinking of what I'm going to go and say to these young people who are going to, who are the future of my world, the one I am trying to change. And I felt, no, this, this is life. We are not prepared for anything. So it's good I am not prepared. We are not prepared at all for anything. Let us not be prepared. But if we have a purpose, and if we know we want to do something and we have to go somewhere and we've got to make something greater happen, then, then we get up quickly. When we fall, we get up quickly. And we walk again. Otherwise we become depressed, damaged, useless, human beings who lost their capacity because they didn't have the will and the awareness and the consciousness to follow on. So never lose that. Find your purpose. Find it. Search it. Search it now. You have so much time. You're so lucky. I don't have that time, but I found it. I found it now. And I'm impatient. You find it now. You find, find it quicker. And you start walking towards it in that direction. And to end now, I will say that I'm standing here talking about a man I loved very deeply. And I've never seen a picture of his on television or at my home or anywhere where I haven't wept. So I think it's happened again. <laughs> he was unforgettable. <laughs> Don't forget him. Don't let him die. He gave up everything. He deprived himself of every single thing, even his own pain. He didn't even have time for his own pain. Faisal Eidi has been serving Eidi Foundation. He has taken over six years ago now. And I must tell you a little bit about him before this ends. The Eidi Foundation donations fell 32% after Edi Saab's death. People wondered, is this trustworthy now? We mustn't let that happen. Vessel Edi, you will see, and I'm saying it, and you note it today, and I'm saying it, through my experience and because I'm a futuristic person and I think humbly that I am a bit of a visionary, that he will convert this country into a social welfare state one day, what his father started. Don't ignore Faisaliti. Watch out for Faisaliti. Help Faisaliti. Support Faisaliti. Become his right arm, his left arms. Don't leave him alone. The elite never help. 
put yourselves out and help him. He's young like you people. He's done his masters. He's going to grow this foundation and give back something from this great legacy that his father left him. But help him. This is my advice to you if you want to if you want to really serve the future of the world because we can serve it from here we have a platform a ready made one thank you